So let me introduce Laura. Uh, we're very lucky to have Laura on our team. And Laura is a senior consultant that heads up our automotive and aerospace uh, consulting and training group. Uh, Laura has uh, over 19, worked for 19 years in the industry in uh, manufacturing, quality engineering, insurance, and process improvement. Laura is a certified uh, lead auditor. You can see the standards there. She's also a Six Sigma black belt. And she's really well educated. <laughs> uh, recently finished her MBA at uh, UMass Lowell. Uh, before that, at MS uh, from Georgia Institute of Technology, and uh, before that, a uh, bachelor's degree from uh, RPI. So uh, I want to thank Laura for taking the time to put the presentation together and speak into the meeting. So come on up, Laura. ready to create an FMEA if you're totally new to it, but it gives you an idea of this the new approach. The revised rating tables for all of the ratings, detection, occurrence, uh, severity, have all been updated for design and process, as well as the new action priority table that we'll uh, go over. And then I'll show you the kind of the key changes that will compare what it looked like in the old version, what it looks like in the new version, so we can kind of think about what you might need to do to change documents that you already have in the old version, or, or um, you know, relate to that. And then a, a brief uh, discussion on transition strategy, more specifically for automotive suppliers that will be required to meet this new standard. Um, for those of you that aren't automotive suppliers, you can choose to work to this new standard, um, but unless your customers are specifically flowing it down to you, you don't necessarily have to do so, because this is uh, an automotive industry document. Feel free to uh, throw questions at me as we go. I don't like to make people hold their questions for the end, because then you stop listening to everything else I say, just so you don't forget your question. <laughs> and then by the time you ask the question, it might not be that relevant for you anymore. Um, but if it's something I know I'm going to cover, I might say, just hang on for a minute, we'll get to that, all right? But if I don't see you, um, you know, raise your hand or whatever, feel free to, you know, get up and down, jump, jump up and down the tables, whatever it takes. How soon are we expected to comply with this new approach? Um, so we're going to cover that when we get to the transition strategy slide, and I don't remember off the top of my head, so let's wait till we get there, because I don't want to give you the wrong numbers. All right. Um, so first, talking a little bit about why this new revision has come out. This is um, basically taking the <coughs> building on the AIAG fourth edition, the FMEA manual. The AIAG is the American Automotive Industry Group. Um, and then the VDA, uh, version, which is the German Automotive Industry Group. And so they finally got together and said, let's, let's make one new standard. So they came out with a new book, which is AIAG and BDA, and they reset us back to first edition just to confuse us. Right? So it's sort of fifth edition of AIAG, but we've, we've gone back to first edition to show. And that's the reason why the cover has the split colors, to show the BDA and AIAG. So why did they want to do that? We, there's a lot of companies that are supplying into both the American in automotive industry and the European automotive industry 
and they're being given different guidelines and directions on their FMEAs. We know that managing our FMEA programs are complicated enough. We don't need to have two different sets of guidelines. So they, um, they decided to come together and standardize, and they've hopefully taken the best practices from each side, and so it should result in a more robust process. Um, the, some of the big issues had to do with the, the rating tables between the two manuals. So something would be rated one way for a German customer, it would be rated a different way for an American customer, and it, it just became, it's too difficult to manage. So now we have a line down on that. That was also causing confusion, complexity. We had companies with multiple you know, they, they would be delivering basically the same product into these two different regions and have to have multiple documents. So this alignment was needed so that we have the same set of requirements across the board uh, within the automotive industry. So going through the seven step approach, what is this about? So this first graphic kind of gives you an overview. Um, so we go into the first step is preparation and project <coughs> planning, then the structure analysis. There's a way so I just realized that. Yeah, thank you. Structure analysis, <coughs> the function, function analysis in step three. I'm going to talk through what each of these things is in more detail. Fourth step, failure analysis. Then we get into our risk analysis and optimization. And then finally, documentation of results and communication. So really, steps probably two through five is what we've been doing pretty much all along. Um, there's some changes to those steps that we'll talk about. But step one, putting more focus on upfront preparation and planning, that's definitely a new shift in this. You know, in the past, we just kind of got a team together and we just start. And this, there's a little bit more project planning involved in how we're going to do that as a team. And then, the documentation of the results, making sure that it's not just we have a filled in form and we file it away somewhere, but that actually gets reported out to appropriate uh, people within the organization, like different levels of management, our customers, suppliers, whatever is important to that document. So this uh, image might be, I'm sure it's difficult for you to read, but this is an excerpt from the manual figure 1.6-1 that is kind of breaks down these seven steps. Steps one, two, and three is the system analysis, four, five, and six, the failure analysis and risk mitigation, and then seven is the risk communication. The pertinent information in here, I'm going to present in the following slides. So it's fine, you can't read it. But I, I, I wanted to show this because when you get your hands on the book, this is a good, uh, a good way to get a good overall um, understanding of the process. So the first step, this drives me a little bit bad, but, okay, so they came up with the five T's, and the first T of the five T's starts with an I. <laughs> like they were trying too hard, I don't know. But the first T is intent, with a T, middle, capitalized and underlined. Um, and what we are trying to understand in, in that with that first T of intent is have all the core team members receive training on FMEAs. If it's not formal training, if it's going to be a, a on the job type of thing, have you set up something? Do you have an internal facilitator to work with them to make sure they're comfortable with the tool? Right? And then have all the core team members allocated time to focus fully participate and their management in supporting them participating. Um, it's not going to be any good to have somebody on the team that can't come and participate, sit on the meetings and be a contributor. So that's kind of the first thing. Do we have the right the right core team members and are they trained and ready to start with the project? Then timing. What APQP phase or VDA maturity level is the project in? Are we in the concept phase? Have we gotten a, a, a head start? Are we in design and development, uh, product design? 
and we're just starting to do our design FMEA. Um, our, have we already launched into production and now we're backpedaling because we didn't do it when we should have? So understanding that is going to affect how the project is run, right? And then knowing your start date and target completion date. If you don't set a target completion date on an FMEA activity, how long do you think it takes to complete the FMEA? Never. A year? Two? Right? Now, we say it's a living document, and we mean that. So you might look at me and say, well, what do you mean complete it? it it's a living document. Yes, but I mean completing the initial analysis that allows us to start to define some actions that we can actually implement off of. So that initial completion. And then we do continue to revise and update it as, as things change. Um, the team, so we have the team members assigned with clearly defined goals and responsibilities. And the different um, roles that you might have as a team leader, a team facilitator, sometimes that's the same person, sometimes it's different people. A, a team champion, which can be helpful if there's other sort of resource, resource constraints and priority conflicts to have someone sort of as a member of management that's pushing for the, for the team to be able to have the time to work on these things. The actual porn team members, um, and then the extended team members might be people that get pulled in for specific pieces of it. Also, we think that we call those subject matter experts. Maybe they're not gonna be there the whole time. You might have certain operators that you pull in for discussion during your process FMEAs, but you don't want them to sit through every team meeting. Um, so defining what uh, each person's role is on the team. The task, so are we clear on what the scope is? So if we have a very complex system, as management just said, go do an FMEA. All right, well, where do we start? What's the scope? Is it the whole system? Is it a subsystem, a component? Um, same thing with our manufacturing process. Processes or process FMEAs a specific process, or is it the whole thing soup to nuts for that particular team? Do we have a clear approach for our documentation and reporting methodology? Is there an expectation that the report will be shared with the customers? And will these results of our FMEA be audited? So is it purely an internal act activity, or is it something that we have to share with our customers? Um, and then finally, the tools. Will we be using a spreadsheet, an Excel-based approach, like we've typically used, most companies used in the, in the past, or a specific software program? Um, more and more companies are starting to use this FMEA software, and with this new approach, we can see maybe the software is going to become even more beneficial because they've added sort of some layers that can make it a little bit harder to look at. The, the, the spreadsheet's now quite wide. Very, it goes very far across. We've added a few columns. Um, and so having a software program can be beneficial and being able to kind of work our way through it without um, getting lost in the this, in this spreadsheet. And a lot of the companies I, I, I've been hearing from various clients that are using some of the software tools for FMEA that their tools are being updated automatically without them even asking for it, that it's being updated to this new approach. And a lot of those companies are offering um, training and things like that as well for their software. Step two is the structure analysis. So what I've done walking through these steps, I'm trying, and it was, really because I, I have a limit, limited amount of time and I didn't know my audience ahead of time as far as whether we, whether we care about design FMEA, process FMEA, or both. So I put them both on the slide so there's something interesting for everyone, all right? So if you only care about one or the other, that's fine. You, you've got them all there. Um, and it also lets you kind of see a little bit of a comparison. So structure analysis for our design FMEA, we're looking at our design interfaces, our interactions, maybe our close clearances. And we can use these tools, the structure tree, block diagram, boundary diagram. The manual gets into more detail on those tools. I didn't have time to go into the detail, so I just put that there. And this is an example down here of what the structure analysis looks like. So we have a focus element, which is what the system is that you are analyzing system that your company is responsible for. 
The next higher level, now if your team is doing a subsystem that goes into a system at for your company, that next higher level might be the system. If you're analyzing an overall final product going out to the customer, that next higher level is going to be the system it's going to be integrated into um, by the customer. Um, and then the next lower level or characteristic. So if it's a system or subsystem, this would be a component or a piece of that system. If you're doing an analysis on a, a more simpler part, like an O-ring, this would be a product characteristic, not a, uh, not a sub component. So this is kind of what I was referring to when I said they, they added more layers, because now they want us to look at these three levels. And we're going to carry these three levels kind of throughout the analysis. Now for our process FMEAs, our structure analysis, our, our process step is a particular step. Our process item, system, subsystem is that, that, like, that product line. So this example, the electrical motor li assembly line, the step is the center bearing press-in process. So in the past, you might have done it where the name of this FMEA was this line, and then we would have this listed as one of the items that we're analyzing. But where it gets interesting for our process FMEA is the this lower level for the structure analysis is a 4M type. So they're trying to tie this back to a fishbone concept. So our, our man, machine, method, and environment are the four M's they're focused on. You can have additional M's if that's what's appropriate for your organization. You can pull in measures, you can pull in other items. Um, but so here, within this process, I want to analyze what things are related to the operator. Then the next section within this process, I'm going to analyze what's relevant to the particular machine being used at that process. So that's kind of how they're bringing in that's a new, a new approach there. So a question? Yeah. So you mentioned scope earlier. Mm -hmm. Is this ex expectation, no matter what we think the scope of the FMEA is, we would still be looking at this three-layered yep. approach? Well. Yep. So even if, that's why I said over here for the design FMEA, even if the scope is a component, then my next lower level is going to be the characteristic on that component that we're analyzing. If I'm doing a more complex assembly or, or subsystem, then the next level lo lower level will be what is that a component within that system. Laura? Yes. What do you mean when you say closed clearance? Is that the completed design? <coughs> no, this sorry, this is there should be an S here. It's close clearances. So tight tight tolerances, close oh, clearances. Okay. Yes. Um, <coughs> in past jobs, mostly in the medical industry, we've done what we call the user FMEA or an application FMEA. Is that part of this at all? Is that um, so the design FMEA, I'm not sure because I haven't used that approach, but the design FMEA um, is always done from the perspective of our end user and our application effect. So that's, and then when we get into our process FMEA, we'll look at both our internal effects and our customer effects and the end user effects. Okay. So I think those, that concept is integrated into this approach. So the, the third step is to define our functions. So this is where we're associating the requirements to the functions through a functional analysis tree or parameter diagram. This example shows, so for our focus element that on the, we said was this commutation system. Uh, the, the requirement here is for the commutation system to transport electrical current between coil pairs of the electromagnetic converter. This is not my example. But, so that was the example. The reason why we needed to do this, because at the higher level, we're feeding into this window lifter motor. This is what it's doing in the vehicle. So 
we need this, our system, to do what it's supposed to do so that it converts electrical energy into mechanical energy according to the parameterization. So it does what the customer needs it to do in their application. So this is where we tie in that application piece of the, um, at, the, at the system level. Then the next lower level here of what allows this to do what it's supposed to do is the brush card body transport forces between the spring and the motor body to hold the brush spring system XYZ position. So it's, this is starting to get into detail. Now there's going to be additional lines of other aspects of this that is allowing this to do what it's supposed to do. Um, for the process FMEA, the, um, when we look at the function of the upper level, we're looking at our internally within our plant, we have to be able to do the assembly of this product. So assembly of the shaft into the pole housing and assembly. Air ship to plant, which is likely our customer. Right? It might be a tier one or might be the OEM, depending on our structure. That's, in this case, assembly of the motor to the vehicle door. Um, and then the end user would be the window raises and lowers. The reason why we're doing this is because well, then when we go to get into our failure modes, we've kind of already thought about what is it that this process is affecting or allowing to occur. So this particular step, is pressing our bearing in place, and then our, our next level function at the require at the upper at the structure level, we talked about the press machine. So now here, machine presses the center bearing into the full housing seat until defined axial position. This is um, probably the most overlooked part of the FMEA process in defining what is the part or the process supposed to do, people want to jump right into what could go wrong. When you're doing an FMEA for a product that's already in production and you've been building it and you have history, it's not that difficult to jump right to what could go wrong. We know what could go wrong, right? We've had failures, we've had customer complaints, we have information. But when you're doing an FMEA up front, truly proactively, as we ideally should be doing, it can be harder to visualize what can go wrong, whether we're talking about a design FMEA or the process FMEA. So taking the time to define these functions of what we need to have go right is going to make defining what could go wrong a lot easier. So if you start to get into the next phases where you're starting to identify your failure modes and you get stuck, then come back a step and relook at your functions. And that will make it flow, flow easier for you. Um, so the next step, step four, is the failure analysis. This is where we get into what we're used to thinking about our failure effects, failure modes, and failure causes. For the design FMEA, we're doing that for each of the product functions that we identified. For the process FMEA, we're doing it for each of our process functions, utilizing the fishbone diagram. Now, do we have to sit as a team and draw out the whole fishbone diagram? Not necessarily, but you're thinking, you're using it as a brainstorming tool to think through the process, right? So we're basically just turning the the function that we stated um, in the in step three into the negative of that function. And so this part of the process becomes very uh, deductive, just intuitive, once you've fully established what the requirements are. Step five is our risk analysis. So this is where we are assigning our prevention controls to our risk causes. This is important. Um, I think in the past, some of us were doing it this way. Some, some FMA forms I've seen combined prevention and detection controls together and it was done sort of after. But uh, this is really putting that up front. So we do our prevention controls first and then we do our occurrence ratings. Um, so we do our prevention controls. 
identify our risk ratings, and then evaluate our action priority, which is a new concept. So they got rid of the risk priority number, and they replaced it with action priority. And I'm well, going to show you, you this. Sorry to interrupt. Yep. Can you just communicate the difference between prevention controls and detection yeah. controls? Yep. So the prevention controls are the things that you put in place, whether it's in your design process for design FMEA, whether it's in your manufacturing process for a process FMEA, to make sure that the process is done correctly in the first place. So a design uh, prevention control could be uh, engineering standards and guidelines, could be um, training for your engineers, um, could be doing things like uh, peer reviews uh, or simulation <coughs> before you proceed uh, with your prototypes, things like that. Um, prevention controls for your process FMEA can be things like work instructions, training. Um, so how do we communicate with the operators how we want them to do it? Or how do we design and control the, uh, the equipment to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing? Okay. So these are the things that are being done up front. A lot of times people forget to give themselves credit for that. We'll see, I'll see examples where people will say, oh, I don't really have any, anything in place for prevention control, but this never really happens, so I'm gonna give it a two for occurrence. Well, if it never really happens, then it's a two. You have something in place for prevention control, you're just not thinking about it. For, for design or manufacturing, it could just be, we've got 20 years of history making this kind of part. We're that confident we're gonna do it correctly because we have, we have the knowledge. Um, so the, that's also a prevention control. Okay. <coughs> Laura, what is the depth? Um, is that severity? <coughs> severity oh, I'm it? sorry. That's a typo. Okay. That is severity. Okay. Yeah, that sh should be an S. <laughs> and then copy and paste there. But we'll we'll look at the actual tables. Um, all right. So the next phase, uh, step six, is the optimization. So once we've done our scoring, we have our action priorities. We know what things we need to take actions on, and um, I'll explain how that works with the new table, the new action priority. But we have um, in here room to put both a prevention action and a detection action. Now, whether you need to do both types of actions for a particular <coughs> case, is, you may not need to do both. You might do a prevention action or a detection action, or you might do both. So instead of just giving us one column to put all our actions into, it's breaking it apart to help us think about when we're rescoring. Because a lot of times people take preventive actions and then they rescore their detection. Or they take detection actions and rescore their prevention. So it's just trying to help, help separate that thought process out. Um, they've also uh, put more detail here with, you know, responsible person's name, target completion date, status, things like that, to make it a more focused on the action part of the process. I always tell people, if you're going to complete an FMEA, because design process doesn't matter, you're going to complete an FMEA, complete an FMEA, and not complete any actions, don't do it. There's no purpose. The whole purpose of the FMEA is to prioritize the actions. So if you're not going to follow through and actually take those actions, then other it being a piece of paper you can hand your customer, it's not adding value to the organization, right? So this is really the most important part. So the optimization piece, um, is it only focused on the higher risk? Yeah, we'll I'll talk about that. Yep. Okay, so step seven. The results documentation, this is where we're communicating our results and conclusions of the analysis. There's, it doesn't give you a prescriptive format to do that in, um, so you can develop something within your organization that is appropriate for you. Um, but kind of, you're not just handing somebody the completed 20 page document and saying, here you go, but generating some sort of summary analysis of that activity around, okay, yes, we have identified these issues, we have completed these actions, 
this is what we learned from this activity. Just trying to kind of put a little bit more formality in the, the closing of, of it. Um, okay, so now I'm going to get into the rating tables. Any questions before we jump into this? Any other questions we didn't address on those, those seven steps? I think it would be a good idea to have a little discussion on those, okay. especially the first, the, yep. the first three steps. The, um, yeah. So let's take a look at the structure analysis. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what is, what is everybody thought? Everybody's thoughts on this now? Does this seem like a big leap from what you've been doing, or is this not that big of a leap? Like I learned on the job, but I was helped working with people who didn't um, have personal experience with it, mm -hmm. and having the, the like the, um, going through the entire process of it, they like jumping towards just oh the risk they've been doing this for so long. It's right. Just, so like having the I really like how it's kind of spelled out of like okay think of all the elements and then what are the risks attached right. to this? Yeah, because one of the um, one of the biggest problems that we see with FMEAs is when not all potential family modes are considered. <coughs> Jump right to the ones that we know are problems, um, but we don't necessarily think about the ones that we don't know are problems. And that's the whole purpose of the FMEA. So if we go through and we really clearly define the structure, the requirements of the part or of the process outputs, then we'll, we have more confidence that we have really thought about all the potentials of what could go wrong. Yeah? Is this supposed to line up with QFD? It seems like the next level and aspect seems like it is pointing towards that. Um, that may be. I'm not certain if that was the intent, but it wouldn't be surprising. Yeah. Uh, QFD's quality function deployment mm -hmm. is a way to identify the requirements uh, mm -hmm. from the customer, right? Yep. So it seems like you have to yeah. somehow yeah. understand <laughs> what all the next higher level mm -hmm. functions are. Yeah. So do you, are you supposed to start with a next level F FMEA? I mean, I've heard that even for the past FMEA process. Right. It seems like even, it's even more important yep. with this. So from a best practices perspective, you're from a D, let's focus on DFMEA for a minute. Your customer should be giving you a design FMEA or a subset of the design FMEA that's relevant to what you are supplying to them. The reality is we usually don't see that. I don't know anybody, even companies who aren't design responsible can't get that from their customers, right? But best practices and something you could implement with your suppliers would be for the customer to have done it at the system level and they're identifying the the structure and the function at the system level that you can then flow down into your subsystem level and you can take that and flow it down into your suppliers right so you could give your supplier an excerpt from your dfma you don't have to do the whole thing but the things that you find that are relevant to how their product performs, their components or material, um, that you're flowing that down to them. And that would help to strengthen that. And currently, today, I think most people aren't doing that, but that would be the direction that we'd want to be moving in, right? Um, one of the other things that I find this to be very helpful with, I've done classes with companies that they're just kind of, they're getting up and going maybe they're startups, they don't have a final product, they don't completely know what the product's gonna look like yet, but we need to start the design FMEA because they really should be doing it sort of in parallel to support the design activity. And we get them together and we start talking about what are the requirements and what could go wrong, and they don't know because they don't even know what the product's supposed to do yet. So for, for those types of less mature products and the concepts, going through this very structured approach with defining the structure and then defining the requirements of those particular um, aspects of the product helps to solidify the design to them so that they're really using the design FMEA as a tool in the design process. And then they can start to analyze 
what could go wrong. Right? So that's really the benefit there. Process FMEA really is just more of the idea that whatever happens within our process step has an effect at multiple levels. A lot of people have already been incorporating this into the current approach, not everybody. Um, so this is kind of making sure we're looking at all three of these levels and that this idea of um, bringing in, sorry, I went too far. This idea of bringing in the 4Ms, 5Ms, 6Ms, however you do it, but bringing in this fishbone type concept in helping us to identify all the potential aspects of the process. And if you think about it, if you've done that in your process FMEA, now when you have a customer complaint or a failure in production, when I go to do my root cause analysis activity, it's 75% of the way done, right? I come back to what we already came up with. We already did a very robust brainstorming against the 5Ms on the FMEA. That's the other benefit for keeping it living, keeping it current. I can use that to then be the basis of my analysis. Now I might find that I overlook something. It might be a new, a new defect I didn't think about, but now I gotta add it for the future. But I might find that it's something that we did consider we were aware of, we did talk about what the causes might be, and but we didn't think it was likely to happen, so we didn't have sufficient controls in place. So now we have to rescore it because now we know how likely it is to happen, but we still have already brainstormed those potential causes of that failure. And we can go look at and run those causes down to see which one is actually at play in that situation. <coughs> Yes. Can you go back to the previous slide, Laura, if you don't mind? So, in talking to a lot of people in the industry, one of the major pushes for this structure analysis was the, um, the, the interfaces and the interactions of products that go into the automobile. If you look at the history of recalls and the history of issues, a lot of it has been how the different components or some assemblies talk to each other. Especially now, we have so much software in the car that I heard the other day there's like 90 million lines of, lines of code, software code in an automobile. <coughs> and all these different things, and I, I think Bose can speak to this too, because they, they supply the amplifiers and the speakers, but they, they're tied into everything else that happens in the car. Uh, it's, 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 been, it's been a major issue, so I think part of the structure now is to identify the interfaces and interactions so you can anticipate any potential issues associated with that. And, and I know a lot of companies have taken advantage of that. They really like this structure analysis. Like Laura said, well, sometimes when we look at FMEAs, people define what the component is of the subassembly, and they don't even talk about functions. They would go right to the failure column, and they brainstorm forever what could go wrong. And then they get frustrated because it's a long list of who the heck is gonna go through and analyze all of these potential issues. If you focus on the functions based on the structure analysis, it really points you in the right direction in terms of what's important. And I think that's the biggest benefit of this. And I really like the way that they did it because it makes you think up front. The other, the other that's, that's a great point, I agree with you. But the other thing too is when we don't take the time to identify the, sh the functions uh, up front of our design, what we tend to do, instead of analyzing how the design could fail to meet the application, which is what we're supposed to be analyzing, we end up analyzing how the design fails to meet the spec. Well, the whole purpose of the design FMEA is to question whether or not we came up with the correct spec. So if all we do is go down the path of, well, what, how could it fail to meet spec, we're not actually really testing that design process. So getting into the, the functional requirements in how that affects the product in the application is what is letting us really test are the specifications actually correct, which is what the design FMEA is geared to do. That's its purpose. Yep. Are there going to be uh, changes to the control plan? Um, not. 
at this time, not related to this change. I don't know if there's something else coming, but it didn't didn't change anything here. And I'm I'm guessing because when they released um, the relate the latest revision of IETF, they put the control plan right in there in the appendix. So I don't think there's. Yeah, I was at the quality summit in Detroit in September. It's right now there's no plans to mm -hmm. update the control plan format. Maybe in the future, but not now. They want this is this is right. big enough. <laughs> yeah. 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 So they want one step at a time. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. All right. Any other commentary on this section of the? By the way, I want to make sure I'm not sure everybody knows this presentation will be available on the website uh, probably Monday. Phil will get it up there. So you can you, you can download it from the website. Uh, I'll just make a comment. Um, it's unlikely, but uh, external auditors <coughs> might look at this documentation as well, not just customers. Correct. Yeah. I wouldn't say it's unlikely. <laughs> If you're if you're an automotive supplier and you have customer specific requirements flowed down to you that you have to do an FMEA, your third party auditor should look at a sampling of them at least, right? So um, even if you submit it in your PPAP and your customer is satisfied and they're all happy, your third party auditor could still um, also the internal auditors. Yeah. In internal it's auditors. Not, why not why not look at this on internal auditing? You should well, be. Well, and in fact for automotive suppliers, during your manufacturing process audits, you're supposed to be reviewing your FMEAs and control plans. Right. Um, okay, so let's just take a look at our revised grading tables. I'm not gonna read through them all, but I want to point out a few things that were was a little bit interesting to me. So for the severity table, didn't really change too much. There, it's still in terms of down here, uh, so no, no effect, no discernible effect. If I give something a severity of one, then I don't need to do the rest of the analysis for that one, right? It has, I don't care. I don't care how, what the occurrence is, I don't care what the detection, it doesn't matter because it's not important. But the two threes and fours are generally annoyance type things, uh, noise, slight, slightly different color, those sorts of things. It's not going to affect performance. And then we start to get into loss or degradation of secondary function, loss or degradation of primary function. And that's pretty much the same as we saw before. What they have changed is previously a nine was a safety or regulatory issue with warning. So if the car put on the warning light before you crashed, it'd be a nine, thinking maybe you have time to pull over, right? And then a 10 was a safety or regulatory issue without warning. And I think they kind of realized that it didn't really matter. Safety issue is a safety issue. So in this version, a 10 is a safety issue. They don't care about warning, not warning. It's now just a 10, and a 9 is a regulatory issue. So if you're reassessing FMEAs that you've done in the past, uh, for severity ratings, you really just need to look at your 9s and 10s. The other ones haven't really changed. The other thing that they've done is they've added into the table that you can recreate in your own internal documentation a column for your own corporate or product line examples. So you can customize and provide examples so that your different teams doing these activities are more likely to stay consistent with each other. It's something that we've always encouraged. It's something I've always trained my clients to do, but they kind of recognize the need for that and built it right into the table. The occurrence table, instead of the old approach was one in a thousand, one in 10,000, etc. Well, if I've never made the part before, and I don't have past history, which is when this tool is even more important, how do I come up with those numbers? We just pick numbers out of the sky. That's what we do, right? So they're trying to make it a little bit more objective, and they're giving it basically on two different categories. So the upper paragraph, kind of wish they had done two columns, but the upper paragraph is the 
maturity of the design technology. So first application, a new technology, tech. No matter how good you think you are, that's high risk. Uh, all the way down into you know first use of design, new design based on similar design, similar to previous design. So as it's a more mature design, um, building on past history and knowledge, that's going to bring the number down. The second thing they have here is the prevention controls. So do we have any standards and best practices defined? So something totally new, we might not have that. Um, if it's you know, the, this prevention control is not targeted to that specific requirement. We have some controls, but maybe they're not specifically uh, uh, directly applicable. So all the way down to, you know, getting into low design expected to conform to standards and best practices considering lessons learned from previous designs. Prevention control is capable of finding deficiencies, et cetera. So that, okay, I got a good feeling about this because we've got product maturity, and we've got the good prevention controls. Look, that's still a three. There's still risk there, because we don't know yet for this particular part. At the bottom of the table, they give you a little bit more information on prevention controls. They talk about best practices for product design, design rules, standards, lessons learned, all that stuff. So that's kind of helping you to think about those things. The detection table, similar to the occurrence table, they've now broken it up into um, kind of the level of maturity of the detection method. So for design FMEAs, our detection method is usually our design verification testing. So do we have this, we, I have no test procedure. I don't even know how I'm gonna do verification testing. Well, that's the 10. We don't know if we're going to catch it or not, right? All the way down to we've got a proven test methodology. We know that it um, correlates well to what we're testing for, et cetera. That's going to be down here in the 234 range. And that 234 is differentiated by am I doing pass fail, test of failure, or degradation testing? So it gives us a much better kind of guideline for that sort of thing. Um, and then the process FMEA for severity, it's very similar to what we had before with, again, the 9 and 10, we have to reassess because if we had something that was a safety issue with warning in the past, now it would be a 10. But now they're giving us detailed severity for end user impact, my ship to plant effect, and my internal effect. So I can rate all three of these and see either which is most severe. Um, and there's, you know, there's two different, the way that the book presents it would be that we, we look at all three of these cases and we, we write down, we score based on what's most severe. Uh, I like to have them each be a separate line, my internal effect and my customer effect. That's just, um, because I think it helps the organization to kind of differentiate what, you know, if I've got yield and scrap and internal issues, um, I don't have good detection for those things because they're going to happen. Uh, I got to worry about my prevention controls, but I might have a customer effect that's a higher effect, but I'm likely to have better uh, detection controls before it gets to the customer, so I like to put them on different lines so I can rate those two things separately. Um, Just a comment on the previous slide. <coughs> there's some, there, 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 a lot of people believe that the impact of the end user is always the highest level, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes it isn't on a process FMEA. Just yep. think about a plastic component that you're selling to your customer. That's an inert plastic that you're selling. From a, from a safety standpoint, it is, it's not a, but internally, you're using some nasty chemicals to make that component and your process steps may have higher severity rating in terms of mm -hmm. the effect. So you, you, you got always, that's why I think it's a good idea to analyze both the, your plant, your ship to, and also the end customer. Yep. Yeah. I agree. Um, so does everybody, everybody do this right now when you're process FMEAs? Do you look at internal effects and customer effects? Are we mostly just focused on the customer effects? <laughs> 
we usually base it on the user requirement specification. <coughs> okay? And then we take that information and we roll it into the design development. And that, that's where we start when we start to produce the product. We come up with our risk analysis. Mm -hmm. Yep. So what you want to be doing when you're, um, when you're a design responsible organization and you've done the design FMEA, you've already done that severity and the, the, the effects on the end users. These categories here, you'll see this column right here is the same as the design FMEA chart was for severity. So if, I, if a particular defect that I talked about on the design FMEA, although there it has a design cause, but that defect has a certain effect on the end user at a certain severity rating, now when I analyze it for the process FMEA, I could have the same defect, now it has a process cause, but it's the same actual defect that should have the same effect on the end user with the same severity rating. So that's, we need to make sure that they, they align. In addition to that, which is coming from the DFMEA into the process FMEA, then we're also going to look at these other effects that the design FMEA doesn't look at. Um, so, let's see, the occurrence table for the uh, process FMEA puts a lot of focus on the prevention controls and whether they are behavioral or technical in nature. So a behavioral control is, well, we told the operator how to do it the right way. A technical control is we gave them a jig so that they can only do it the right way. Or some sort of alignment fixture or whatever. It doesn't have to be completely foolproof, but it's some sort of um, supporting thing. It's not just dependent on the behavior of the person doing the job to get it done right. So our Something that's purely behavioral, yeah, it's not that good, right? Um, it's likely to happen, but if we get down into our, these technical preventions, prevention controls, then um, we can bring our, our current ratings down. Now over time, as you gain experience with a particular product, you come back and re-rate these based on reality, right? Based on what you're really seeing. Um, so if you originally said, oh, I don't know if our prevention controls are good enough, this could happen, I'm going to call it a seven, but then you launch into production and you're shipping product and you're not seeing returns from the customer and you're not having internal rejects, then it's probably not a seven. Then you can bring it down. Our detection uh, table, um, again, looks at the detection method maturity. So this is the tests or inspections that we're doing in production. Um, and the maturity of it, whether it's been proven to be effective and reliable, maybe do we have gauge r, &R results that we, or we don't, we don't know <coughs> enough about that measurement system, then we can't assume that we have a robust detection method. Um, and then, you know, the you know if we have proven it and we've done gauge R and R, then that's going to give us a better. Um, there's a six for human, a five for machine based. If it's proven and the results have been acceptable, again machine based. This is where we get into automated <coughs> detection methods. This is in station or downstream. So that's kind of there's these little nuances there. A lot of times when I look at FMEAs. Uh, that companies have completed, the biggest issues I see are in the ratings. We, we're, way too, we're way too easy on ourselves. <coughs> we assume, oh, this will never happen, and if it does, we're definitely going to see it before it gets to the customer. Right? That's the typical, and everybody wants to rate everything really low. So I'll look at something where everything's rated like a one or a two, and I'll be like, okay, great. When I come in there, I'm going to see an automated process with light controls and switches and it's going to shut down if there's failures because that's what one and twos mean. And I get in there and it's somebody manually inspecting a part. <laughs> nope. So we have to be honest with ourselves about these things because that's where the risks are. Alright, so now talking about this new concept of action priority. 
So what? Why did they do this? Yeah. Oh, a quick question about the rating tables. Yeah. Uh, do we have some leeway behind our own tables, or are those uh, the recommended or guidelines? They're or guidelines, they're just like they were in the previous revision. Unless your customer, you know, tells you it has to be exactly that. Um, but the book is written as it's guidelines. I think that they're expecting you to use this product yeah, line examples column to allow you to modify. Right, so if you look at it and you say, well, we don't have this machine-based automated, but we, we really believe that this system is better than a six, okay, you put what your system it is where you think it belongs. So that's why they've given you this knowledge. So I was just gonna say, yeah, I mean, uh, having examples for the people that are doing the FMEs, and having examples, uh, realistic examples that pertain to your business, your products, your design is huge when it comes to the people making the right decisions and uh, when they're discussing criteria. Because they can clearly associate with a, the, with a, you know, as close to a number as possible. Yeah, and it takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. Um, when I participated or observed FMEA teams, this is the most painful part. People, by the end of the day, they're just like banging their heads against the wall. They don't care anymore. Oh, fine, make it a five. Like they just, <laughs> you know? Like this is like the worst part of it. People get all, you know, oh, well, you said it to two, I said it to me, and now we're gonna argue about it for 15 minutes. So the more, um, that's one of the reasons why they gave more information here. They got more descriptive to help with that. They're trying to help this be moving towards more of an objective process. We know it's going to be subjective, because it is, right? We're human beings, we're making decisions. Um, but the more that your organization can put specific examples and things in to help those teams, then they don't have to duke it out. They can just, oh, yeah, that's where our product, okay, yeah, we'll do that one. And, it, and then you'll have better consistency between different FMEAs and different teams. Yeah? So is this is part of the living document where you would go back and update it and change the risk. Yes. This yeah. Is, okay. So yeah. So way. if you have um, if you have customer complaints, uh, you better go back and look at your FMEA and see if you rated it properly in the first place. Right? Did you say that there was a potential for that to get out to the customer? If you aren't having failures and defects, you know, a year or six months after you launch the product, depending on your volumes, you want to come back and look at your actual data and see how you rated it and maybe bring some numbers down. Yeah. Yeah. So we see that this is a six point scale? 10, it's 10, I just, it's on two pages. Oh, okay. Yep. They're, because they got so wordy. They no, I thought they went no, down. no, oh, okay. no. Yeah. It's because they got so wordy with some of these that doesn't fit as easily on one slide. Even in the book, it's actually done on two pages like this, so. Um, yeah, but there, we're still on the one to ten scale. Didn't change that. Okay, so let's talk about action priority. Why did they do this? Well, does anybody think that the RPN was like the greatest thing ever, and like it really made sense, and we're really happy with RPNs? Yeah. Right? There's so many problems with RPNs. There's some customers want you to use a threshold. Oh, but if we use a threshold, then we're not doing continuous improvement because we just stop once we get below the threshold. Oh, if I have a threshold number, my engineers sitting around the table doing the FMEA will just lowball the numbers so we don't hit the threshold. Uh, the other big issue was that it equally weights the three elements, the severity, the occurrence, the detection. Do we really think that those three elements are equally important? We need to put a little bit more weight on the severity, right? That's if it's something that's very low impact on us or our customers, one, two, or three, do we want to spend just as much time on it as we would with something that's higher? Maybe the detection level is higher. Maybe we're less likely to notice it before it gets to the customer, but do they care? Right? So what the action priority does is it gives us a lookup table. So we still have our one to 10 scale for each of the three categories. But now instead of multiplying them or trying to come up with a number, instead of them trying to like come up with some fancy formula and trying to weight severity over the other ones, they just said, we're just gonna make a lookup table, all right? So in that lookup table, if it comes up as a high, you're required to identify an action to improve prevention or detection controls or both. 
Or, if you feel you, you cannot, you must justify and document why the current controls are adequate. So that line should not be left blank. If there can't be an action there for whatever reason, something needs to be stated there of why to justify. A medium, you should do it, but it's up to you. So you can't get a nonconformity from your third party auditor because you didn't take action on a should. Your customers can complain because they're your customers. They can tell you to do whatever they want. But um, And then a low is you could do it. you got a low hanging fruit, something easy to do. You can, but you don't have to. So similar to our old concept of if it's a high number RPN, we have to take action. But what does a high number mean? So now they've given us a little bit more definition. So the way it works, it's a little tricky when you first look at it. First, you're gonna look at what is your severity rating. So nine or 10, we're gonna come here. Then we're gonna look where's our occurrence rating, and then look where's our detection rating. So if we got a nine or a 10, and we've got a two to three occurrence and a seven to 10 detection, that's a high. So at first it looks a little like, you know, well that's a lot of steps for us to figure this out, but it, it makes sense. Um, so you can see in the nines and tens, most of them are highs until you get down to fair, uh, low, to very low occurrence and high or very high detection. Then, okay, then we're a medium or a low. Um, then the seven to eights, we still have a fair amount of highs in there, depending on our occurrence and detection. We've got our four to sixes. Not too much there for high. The only time that a four to six is gonna give us a high is if it's an eight to 10 occurrence and above a five for detection. And then um, a two to three is never going to be a high. And a one, we don't even care why to rate it. <laughs> All right? So does this make sense now that we see it? It's not so scary. Like you've been hearing about it. It's like, oh, there's been this new approach. It's this whole big thing. It's just this table. It's not a big deal. This is totally new. Yeah. This is, no, 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 we haven't practiced this in the FMAA world forever. Yeah. This is something that that is totally new to this handbook. Right, so now for those of you companies that aren't automotive suppliers, that aren't necessarily going to be required by your customers to go to this new handbook, if you don't implement anything else in your process, you don't have to do the three level function analysis and all of that, but if nothing else, transition to this action priority approach. This, this is going to be an improvement over your RPI model. Uh, be, yes? I think that makes sense. We hit a third party audit, audit recently and in our expansion of, of approach we kind of missed detection. Mm -hmm. Not in the FMEAs but in the standard response, product expansion approach. And we were looking how to correlate it. But now with this table it's very obvious to me how to do it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And I think you can also uh, get a lot of value out of the rating tables, whether you, the other rating tables, the occurrence and detection rating tables, whether you use them is exactly as is or not, but the idea of looking at my prevention controls or the maturity of my technology um, into setting those, um, setting our ratings, I think is a lot more helpful than telling somebody, well, if it's one in 10,000, then it's a whatever. Unless you have all the data and you can plug it in and get the number and then look it up on the table and it's fine. But when you're doing this proactively for a new product, which is when it's most important, then we need something else to, to go by. This next section is just to kind of show some comparisons between the old format, the old tools, and the new tools. I've kind of mentioned a lot of them as I've gone through, so I'm going to go through, through it a little bit quickly, no. but just kind of your, your reference where something is still confusing to you. Um, so the first one is the structure analysis. So in the DFMEA table, the old, uh, now I can't keep put, pointing to the book, you took the book away from me. Um, the uh, AIG, we just had one column that said item and function. 
now that item has been split out into these three different items of our focus element, which is probably what we put in the item column before, but now also the next lower level and the next higher level. So that's um, first. The function analysis, again, it was combined into this one column previously. Now we have the three level function analysis. Yep. Can you go back one, please? Yep. And maybe you mentioned this before, but uh, so most people here in automotive, so if you're looking at focus element, the next higher level and the next lower level, very well could be something that you're not working on. Correct. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. So this could be something that you're getting from a supplier, or it could be if you're at that, if you're further back in the supply chain, if your product is less complex, then this would just be specific characteristics of that product. So for, can I pick on the O-rings? I use that as my example. <laughs> so for an O-ring, I don't have a next lower level uh, component going into the O-ring. It is, but here I can have ID, OD, thickness, color, I don't know, whatever your requirements are, right? So that's it. If you're down in that level of detail where it's really a component, in that regard, what your your design is really about is meeting that spec for that customer because they de de design it into their into their system given those characteristics. Um, but if you're dealing in more complex systems, then this could be a a sub system that you also produce, or it could be something coming from a supplier or a subcontractor, um, or it could be a component. Depends on your where you are in the complexity and in the supply chain. Would it make sense to have a raw material in that column? If the raw <coughs> material characteristics are a defining feature um, in the performance of the product, then yes. Right. So if you were using, um, so in my O-ring example, they're using resins, right, to do that. If the characteristics of that resin have an impact on the final performance of it, then you might go to that, to that level. Just one more. What example, what would go in the history, the first call? This oh, seems to be a new okay. Order. Yep, good, that's a good, um, so this is how we keep it a living document. So we're not gonna put anything here while we're generating it, while we're creating it. <coughs> This is going to be blank. Later on over time, if we want to update a particular line, we can use this column to indicate that that line was updated and when it was updated. It's like a rep history. So we can put an ECO number or whatever. Yeah, rep history, you can put an asterisk, and it's optional. So how you choose to use this column is up to your organization. And then the issue number would just be so you can number the lines yep. for you know just organizational purposes. A question. When filling these out, should we have any concern about proprietary information being put out there? Mm. Yeah, so that's one of the reasons why when we talked about in the scoping, in the project planning, we wanted to identify whether or not this is something we have to share with our customer. So I always tell people, you want this to be a tool for you that improves your business. So. When you do your analysis with your team, I would include everything. But you can have some way. They actually have a column in Design FMEA uh, format called uh, filter code. So you can put a filter code in there, make it whatever you want to indicate that it's proprietary. And then before you send it to the customer, you delete those lines out of the customer <coughs> version. So that's a good way to handle that. For your internal purposes, you still want to include everything because you don't want to overlook it just because you don't want to share it with the customer. Um, okay, so function. Then in our failure analysis, I um, the one thing that they've done is they switched the order. So the old chart, we went failure mode, effects, causes. And when we did the causes, we had to hide the effects column because we wanted to make sure we were doing the causes of the failure modes. Now, they've got effects, then failure mode, then cause. 
you might still brainstorm the failure mode first and then think about the effects, but they're trying to show kind of this, um, this relationship where the failure mode drives the effects and then the causes of the failure mode. So they put the failure mode in the center because it's what has the relationship to both of the other columns. <coughs> Um, the other thing I didn't point out when I went over earlier is they've continued this concept of the three layers by saying failure mode of the focus element, failure effect of the next to the next higher level or end user, and then failure cause of the next lower level. So that's the reason why we're defining the requirements and functions at all three levels because <coughs> they're going to equate into our causes, failure modes, and effects. Um, I kind of skipped that point, but what do I talk about there? So the classification column in Design FMEA, they took it out. Um, that used to be used for special characteristics. I think it should still be in there. I don't know. They, they took it out because the justification is you don't know the classification when you're creating the Design FMEA the classification is an output of the design FMEA. Okay, fine. But you can use this filter code column to indicate those special characteristics. And now it's over here on the far right after you've done your action priority. You can use that information to help you decide what your special characteristics are. Um, and then changing from the RPN to the uh, action priority. Can you give an example of uh, the special characteristics? I haven't run into that part before. So if we're doing a design FMEA, and we identify that a particular feature or characteristic needs to be controlled in order to meet our customer's application, mm -hmm. then generally from a, in the automotive industry, we call that a special characteristic. And it could be um, significant, meaning it's something we need to control. It could be critical, meaning it's something that could have a safety or regulatory impact or it could have some other um, category depending on the customer requirements. In other industries, like in aerospace, they call them key characteristics. It's that idea. Okay, so it says flagging it is like critical for some reason. Mm -hmm. And the reason why you want to put it in the design FMEA is because then you, that design FMEA goes over to the process FMEA team and they need to make sure <coughs> that they're assessing the risks with meeting those characteristics in the process. Um, well, the other thing yeah. that they changed in the previous slide is the uh, probability of occurrence now is in the middle, right? Yeah. Yeah, they moved uh, prevention over before we do the occurrence ratings. Where before, I get this, before the, they had the occurrence column and then the prevention column. They want to make sure you know to figure out your prevention controls first before you rate your occurrence. So they moved. They swapped it around. So now it goes prevention controls, occurrence, detection controls, detection. So I think what you just said, just to be sure, is that you should be estimating the occurrence based on the prevention being in place. It is current prevention control. So the one that's in place. So what you have currently in place. Now if you're doing a design FMEA and you have design guidelines and lessons learned and things like this from previous designs, that's a current control because you've designed it with that in place. Your current detection controls, if you've already um, developed your DB testing plan, your design verification plan, and you know this is, we're gonna run this test, we've got a plan, we've got this many samples, we know when it's gonna be run, you might be able to rate, you might say that's a current detection and rate based on that. If you don't know what that plan looks like or when you're going to run it or anything else, I would leave this, I don't know, this becomes a high number and now that drives getting that DB testing done as a high priority. For process FMEA, my current controls, if I don't have a work instruction yet, because I haven't created it yet, when I do my FMEA, I'm going to leave it blank for prevention controls so that it drives an action to get my work instruction done. This is be what you already have in place. So your work instructions, your control plans, your operator trainings, 
at the time when we're doing our process FMEAs, those things might not be done yet. We want to not give ourselves credit for them if they're not done yet, because sometimes we forget to include the key thing that we mentioned because the number came out low because we said we had it as a control and then we miss it. So it's what we currently have in place. Um, Question over here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to that effect, um, is this intended to help improve DV testing or? Yes. So, so if you, if the controls basically aren't adequate, then that should affect how you do the testing, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. DV testing <clears throat> is um, the main detection action that you can do for a design FMEA. There's other prevention actions you can do, but that's the main detection action we're focused on. It's so the purpose of design FMEA, one of the key purposes is to develop and prioritize your DV test plan. It's hard with so many OEMs, at least, that, that at the levels that we deal with, they have very prescriptive DB <coughs> testing. And I don't know if we've ever been successful at, I mean, we could do whatever we want internally, I guess, but is, is, is it accepted in the automotive industry to say, hey, our DFME is pointing to this, which is different from your default testing. We want to, we want to go ahead and do it, do it what we think is the right way. You can certainly try. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the data that gives you the opportunity to have that discussion with the customer. They may push back and say, "Hey, we have experience buying this part. We know this is what you need to do. You need to do this testing." Okay, fine. You're the customer, but we're also going to do this other thing because we want to protect us, right? So, those are things that you that that's part of what you want to be looking at in the actions that you're identifying coming out of the design FMEA. Yep. Let me just add a little bit to that. <clears throat> so if you've got a, uh, a failure that you're going to detect in this established or defined verification plan, then that would be a, a, low, a low number, a high detection. But if it's something that's different that's not in there yet, then it would be a high number, a low detection, because you haven't written that particular test in. Right? Correct. Yeah, and the, the, that rating has to do with also the, the um, how well correlated that test plan is with real usage and application. So if you have data from previous similar designs that tells me, okay, if I fail this test in DB, it means I'm, I'm likely to have these production failures and vice versa then that's going to give you a better detection rating than something where you don't really know whether that DB plan is going to get you, uh, you know, long-term liability type results, right? Um, all right, so, oops, all right. The, um, similarly with the process <coughs> FMA, we've got you know, we just had one column for our process step. Now we're breaking it out into the item, the step, and the 4M work element. Oh, I lost. There we go. Uh, the function, we went from the one column to the three. Same, the same thing with the uh, order being moved around. Um, the, the classification, we do have a column here called Special Product Characteristics. Um, you could also put Special Process Characteristics here, but they've put a specific column in here and they moved it to the end because they're realizing we're going to use this process. We need to get this analysis done to identify what those special characteristics are. So they moved it to the end instead of having to kind of backtrack as well as the, the action priority. And then this is an optimization. This applies, um, I think this applies to both, but uh, so the recommended action is now being broken down into the two, prevention and detection. We now have a status column. So if it's open, completed, um, discarded, there's a couple more optional ones that you can use. And then specific the action that was taken with a pointer to the evidence. 
So if we implemented a work instruction, do we have a release, an ECO number, or some, or, or the actual document number, or whatever it is, and then the restore as we had before. So that's kind of that high level on the changes in, in just the tool, okay? Um, and then I have one slide on, I think it's just one slide on the tr transition strategy. Now this is specific for automotive suppliers. You need to decide in your organization if your customers aren't flowing this down to you, which pieces of this you think you want to take, which pieces you might not want to take, and how you're gonna approach transitioning. If you wanna just apply it to new things going forward or if you're gonna change your current documents. Um, so according to the, to the manual, what they put out there is that your existing FMEAs that you developed per the fourth edition manual can stay as they are. This is unless, unless your customer specific requirements are different, right? That's always the caveat for automotive. Um, but you wanna be planning your transition to the new process and tools, so your internal procedures and all of that should be focused on the new tools. But you can use your existing FMEAs for a starting point. Um, you wanna think about um, the new rating scales, the analytical methods, the format, things like that. Uh, over time, you might take the things you currently have established and move them over into this format so that as you keep them living documents, especially for products that are in long-term production that you get, have a lot of engagement with, it's worth moving them over to the new format because it'll be easier, you'll be managing two different systems. Um, but there's no real time frame on this. Um, and then new, new projects, you know, that is going to be, so this comes back, somebody had a, you had a question on the time frame. They didn't publish that. They didn't come out as one industry whole saying everybody must transition by X date because this is a guideline document. The only thing that makes us have to comply with this document are our customer specific requirements telling us that we have to follow that. So it's up to your customer specific guidelines to tell you the transition date um, milestones by customer. So uh, at this point, it, because it came out in June, I haven't heard from any of my clients that any of their customers are requiring it yet. Some of my clients that are in new, you know, startups that are getting ready for like their first automotive customer or are starting to implement an IATF system, I'm trying to get them trained to the new approach so that they're doing it that from scratch, they don't have to transition. But those of you that are already established, you've been doing it the old way, you'll have time to work towards the new way. But it's to your benefit. I think, I think many of the things that they've changed are going to make the process better. Uh, so you wanna kind of develop a plan within your company that makes sense for you. A lot of these things, when we look at these differences, a lot of these things you will be able to take current FMEAs and copy and paste things from one column into another column. You might have to create some new, okay, well I hadn't thought about this, I gotta fill in that column. Or I hadn't thought about this, I have to detail that. But the basic content of what's there, you don't have to start from scratch. All right, any, um, I guess I could go to my question slide, but any, any other questions that we didn't address? How, how's everybody feeling about this now? Do, does, do you feel like, okay, yeah, that makes sense, we can go do this, or that's a bunch of bunk, let's keep doing it the old way, or? Good yeah, some good improvements. So now I just gotta figure out how to, how to do it, how to make it work, yeah? Um, so the, I think the previous AIAP manual um, listed out some alternative methods, um, maybe a different way of calculating RPN, even other things like the RPFM, things like that. Is that left out of this manual? Uh, How to calculate the RPN? <laughs> yeah, they had like some, and maybe instead of multiplying, I think they had something about, oh, maybe you just add them. And of I think that, like, yeah, the, that, they, that's out of there because they, yeah. they went to this yeah. actual priority yeah. approach. There is one other thing in the new manual um, that I didn't present. They added a FMEA for 
Can I borrow the book for a second? <laughs> I don't know. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Give it back. back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to raffle it off to someone else. <laughs> so they added, they added this uh, supplemental FMEA for monitoring and system response. And what this is about is systems that do like in-vehicle monitoring, error, error states and things like that. Sensors. Um, sensor. So there's a whole section of how you can apply the, this process to those types of systems mm -hmm. because they're kind of new. Um, so I just want to mention yeah, if anybody's doing something um, more like that, there is a, a section that covers that in here. Yeah. Okay. And that addresses a lot of the risk with uh, those safety systems, sensors and all that. Yeah. All, All right. right, so I'll turn it Great. to Angela. Thank you very much, Laura. Great presentation.